Hello, I'm Dr. Joanne Lohr, and this is the Society of Vascular Surgery Briefing on Venous Insufficiency. Veins are thin-walled pressure conduits which function to return blood from the periphery to the heart. Muscular contractions in the arms and legs help propel blood with intraluminal valves to prevent retrograde flow or reflux. Venous reflux can be observed when valvular dysfunction or destruction have occurred associated with varicose vein formation. Valvular reflux results in an increase in ambulatory venous pressure. Clinically, this results in lower extremity edema, pain, itching, venous ulcerations, and in the serious form, limb loss. Collectively, these symptoms are known as chronic venous insufficiency. 10 to 35 percent of adults in the United States have some form of chronic venous insufficiency, with venous leg ulcers affecting 4 percent of people over the age of 65. Due to the high prevalence of the disease, population-based costs to the United States government for chronic venous insufficiency and venous ulcer care has been estimated to be over a billion dollars a year. In addition, 4.6 million workdays per year are lost due to venous-related illness. Age, gender, pregnancy, weight, height, race, diet, bowel habits, occupation, posture, and previous deep vein thrombosis, as well as genetics, have all been proposed as predisposing factors associated with varicose vein formation. Approximately one-third of men and women ages 18 to 64 have varicose veins. The disease prevalence leads to significant health care benefits from the treatment of varicose veins. Surgical treatment for varicose veins includes high ligation, saphenous vein stripping with or without phlebectomy. Until the past few years, this was most commonly performed procedure by surgeons worldwide. Recently, several less invasive treatment modalities that have claimed to be as effective as surgery have become available. These include radiofrequency and laser ablation of the great and short saphenous veins with or without phlebectomy and liquid or foam sclerotherapy. The Society of Vascular Surgery has teamed with the American Venus Forum in an endeavor to develop clinical practice guidelines to improve the care of patients with venous disease. Randomized controlled clinical trials and observational studies were published in the 1960s and 70s which showed sclerotherapy was as, as effective as surgery, particularly in patients with incompetent perforating veins. In addition, patients in these studies preferred sclerotherapy, which gave better initial results and was less likely to require additional treatments. However, studies with longer follow-up periods suggest the benefits of sclerotherapy declined over time. In a randomized clinical controlled trial, the five-year failure rates were 10% in surgical patients and 74% in patients with compression therapy and sclerotherapy. Even when liquid sclerotherapy was combined with high ligation and the saphenofemoral junction under local anesthetic, at five years, it remained inferior to stripping and ligation of the great saphenous and incompetent perforators in terms of patient satisfaction. When endovenous laser ablation was compared to standard ligation and stripping in four randomized controlled trials, no difference was detected between the two procedures at three months in terms of improvements in quality of life scores, short, short form 36, and disease-specific quality of life, the Aberdeen varicose vein symptom score, and the venous clinical severity score. There was slightly increased incidence of postoperative pain and bruising noted in the high ligation and stripping group. However, in studies, no difference was detected at 26 months between the two procedures in terms of aesthetic result, patient satisfaction, and pain. Compared with surgery, laser ablation of the saphenous vein had a faster return to normal activity, return to work, and shorter duration of postoperative disability. One of the problems with these trials is the short-term follow-up makes it difficult to assess varicose vein recurrence. When laser and radiofrequency ablation were compared, no difference was found between the two procedures in terms of efficacy and safety. Rate of vein occlusion at two weeks after the procedure was about 96% in both groups. Follow-up at three years showed no neovascularization in the groin and marked symptom improvement in most patients in both the laser and the radiofrequency groups. Most of the patients treated with endovenous therapies required additional procedures such as microphlebectomy or sclerotherapy. When comparing conservative therapy with flush ligation of the saphenous vein and greater saphenous vein stripping, after two years of follow-up, surgical patients reported better quality of life. Significant benefits were also seen in symptomatic and anatomic measurements. No significant difference was identified between the two groups for ulcer healing or recurrent ulceration rates, however. When comparing surgery and radiofrequency ablation, studies with short-term follow-up of three years duration are available. Endovascular obliteration of the greater saphenous vein with radiofrequency compared to conventional stripping was associated with a faster return to work time, 1.1 versus 3.9 days, lower pain scores, 
better short-term quality of life scores, and higher patient satisfaction. No significant difference was identified between the two procedures in venous insufficiency recurrence. When surgery is compared against all endoluminal ablation therapies, a meta-analysis shows that surgery led to non-significant risk reduction in varicose vein recurrence. In general, all treatments for varicose veins are well tolerated without significant periprocedural adverse effects, particularly deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism, which are very infrequently reported. Local complications were common, but generally minor. Both surgical and endoluminal invasive treatments are superior to conservative management in terms of ability to eliminate varicose veins and decrease their rate of recurrence. The study of liquid sclerotherapy, foam, and endoluminal thermal ablation therapies have only short-term follow-up data available at this time, making them unsuitable to assess long-term outcomes. Surgery appears to have a low to moderate quality of evidence demonstrating less recurrence and better long-term results. Compared with surgery, however, liquid or foam sclerotherapy and endoluminal thermal ablation therapies, both laser and radiofrequency, are associated with a faster return to work time, shorter duration of disability, and less pain. Evidence of quality of life is sparse and inconclusive. Data regarding the complications of DVT and pulmonary embolism are also sparse and poorly reported. There is very low quality of evidence to suggest preferential treatment for varicose veins. Surgery, sclerotherapy, foam therapy, endoluminal ablation, radiofrequency or laser all appear to be safe with rare side effects. Surgery, however, is the only treatment that has long-term effectiveness data. The other less invasive treatments are associated with shorter disability and less pain, but only short-term effectiveness data is available. This briefing is made possible by a grant from Cook Medical. To learn more about vascular health, visit vascularweb.org.